Helen Gerhold and I am Executive Director for the Lyra Society. Lyra is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that brings free harps, harp lessons, harp presentations, and college and financial aid counseling at no cost to students all across Philadelphia. I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us tonight and thank you so much to Nadia for allowing their platform for us to share our story. I hope you enjoy. So I believe it was the summer of 2004 when the American Harp Society held its national conference in Philadelphia that I then realized the history of Philadelphia High School for Girls when it came to the harp. Ann Hobson Pilot, former harpist of the Boston Symphony, Paula Page, former harpist of the Houston Symphony, and Susan Diedrich Pajovich, former harpist of the Dallas Symphony, all graduates of Girls High in Philadelphia. And there was a special performance for this conference where they all came together for the first time as part of this Philadelphia Heritage Concert. And it was really a tremendous um, inspiration and, and just enlightenment to know that this harp history existed within the halls of Philadelphia High School for Girls. So that fall, I visited this school and others and discovered, yes, these concert grand harps made by Lion and Healy are still existing. Some of them not in great shape, some of them in really bad shape. I think we found one in pieces. Uh, but we were able to salvage several of them and along with the um, 
support of Lion and Healy harp manufacturers, we uh, sort of decommissioned a few harps and we were able to replace them with brand new harps. So when you're building a program that involves very large expensive instruments, you have to start gradually. So I'm so happy now that we are very established with our Glissando harp program in many schools throughout Philadelphia, where we can teach the harp to young women and young men in our high schools and throughout uh, some of the other schools as well. Hi, my name is Azalema Ramirez. I'm 16 years old, a junior at the Philadelphia High School for Girls. I've been playing the harp for four months and today I'll be giving you a mini history lesson. The harp dates back all the way down to 2500 BC in ancient Egypt. The harps were shaped as a hunter's bow which had very few strings. The column was added during the Middle Ages by Western Europe, which allowed for many more strings and strength to withstand the higher string tension. The very earliest harps that had a sound box naturally amplifies the sound of the instrument by plucking the strings. The harp dates back to the 14th century island where the harp remains as a national symbol today. From, from the very first year of teaching at those that first class at GAMP, uh, I could see a change in my students throughout the course of our lessons, not just in their mastery of the instrument and their progress, but their confidence level. Uh, each, each of those particular kids already played music, they already had an instrument, um, they went to this great school for musicians essentially, but the harp was really something new for them that they could call their own. And with all of them, I just really saw their personalities blossom over the course of our years of study together. And because I did teach that first class for six or seven years, because I started them when they were so little, uh, we really, I became close with all of them. And there really was an important mentor-mentee relationship that blossomed as well. So I really, I look back fondly on those first few students and first few years of teaching. I'm 16 years old and a sophomore at Central High School in Philadelphia. I've been playing the harp for six months and I'm going to show you the basic elements of my harp. This harp has 34 strings. The largest concert harps, which you would see in an orchestra concert, have 47 strings. The colored strings create a pattern like a map so I can see where to place my hands. All the C strings are red. And the F strings are black. Right now, the C strings are set to C major, like the white keys on the piano. But I can engage the levers to create sharps by raising the pitch of each string. If I pull all my F levers up, I can play a G major glissando, my favorite sound on the, on the harp. The first time I heard the harp 
was the Nutcracker Ballet. My father was playing violin in the pit orchestra and he pulled me out of school that day, so that was super exciting. And he made sure I had a front row seat right at the edge so he could keep an eye on me from time to time. So the ballet begins, and of course, it's beautiful, and the dancers are gorgeous in their tutus, and the music is amazing. But about 15 minutes in, I heard a sound that blew me away. And I looked into the pit, and there was this woman playing a golden harp. And that's when I knew I had to play this instrument. When I asked my parents if I could play the harp, they were astonished. Well, why would you want to play the harp? That seems like a very expensive instrument. And I had to really work on them because I was not necessarily the most serious child. I was a little precocious and uh, I didn't always stick with things and I didn't stick with the violin, I stuck with the piano, but I really kept begging them. About a year later, they surprised me on my birthday with a student-sized harp. My name is Casey Sexton, I am 16 years old, and I go to Girard Academic Music Program, where I'm in the 10th grade. I have been playing the harp with the Lyra Society for the last six years. When I auditioned for the Lyra Society, I was asked to write a short essay explaining why I wanted to play, and here's what I said. The first time I heard the harp, I loved the sound. Every night, I would ask my mom if I could do lessons, and she would say that she would look for a place that I could play. When I saw YouTube play, I knew then that I really wanted to play. Some things you should know are, I have been asking my mom if I could play the harp since I was five years old, and I am really looking forward to seeing it again. Since I wrote this letter, the Lear Society has exposed me to many things, from master classes to the Curtis Institute Summerfest program, and I got to take part in master classes with students from around the United States and from Canada. It was one of the biggest things that have ever happened to me. Well, when we are ready to start a heart program at a new school, or when we are looking for new students at an existing school, when we've lost some students to graduation, uh, the first thing we do is we do a presentation. And what that involves is usually two of our teaching artists uh, will go into a school and we play for the students, we give them a little introduction to the harp as an instrument, um, and kind of tell them what lessons would be like. So in that way, we're reaching hundreds of students a year just to introduce them to the instrument, uh, to hear music in a different way, and to learn about music and the instrument that we love. From that point, um, interested students, students who are interested in lessons, will sign up for tryouts. And the harp tryouts are one of my favorite things. So anyone who wants to come is invited. And even though of whatever group we get, we can usually only offer lessons to maybe two to four students, Everyone gets to pluck a string. Everyone gets to learn how to play the lasando, and everyone gets that one-on-one -on -one time with the teacher behind an instrument. And we ask them to play really simple things, usually just with one finger. And we're not looking for the next harp prodigy or concert artist. Um, we're just looking for a student who's intrigued by the instrument, wants to learn it, wants to practice, and is able to work with a teacher, listen, and uh, kind of follow instruction. So occasionally a student will at some point decide that maybe the harp wasn't for them. Uh, it's too much time, it's harder than they thought it was going to be, any number of reasons. And so sometimes during the school year there will be an opportunity for someone on the wait list to start lessons mid-year. And that was the case with Maya. Uh, I remember Maya's tryout. I knew she was talented. I thought she was very sweet. And we truly wanted to take about half the kids that uh, tried out that year. And we just couldn't. So midway through the year, we did have a student decide to discontinue harp lessons. 
who wrote an extremely well-written letter to me explaining her reasons, and I think she has a very bright future, possibly as an attorney. Uh, but at any rate, it meant that in January, Maya was chosen from the waitlist. So I got an email from Miss Snow, my um, music teacher, saying that there was an opening and I was in, I could be in the program and I was, I was really excited and I think that was like the best birthday gift I've ever gotten because yeah, it's just been so amazing to be able to learn the heart. Hi, my name is Hannah Nielsen, and I'm 16. I'm a junior at the Philadelphia High School for Girls, and I've been playing heart for about two and a half years. It's been really exciting for me and such a great opportunity for me and my family, and I really appreciate it. It's like um, something that not a lot of people get to experience, especially because I get to do it for free because I'm on scholarship, um, and it's just such a blessing for everyone in my life and especially my own personal life. Um, starting uh, the harp was really weird. It was a really um, out of the blue thing for me because my older sister was a student for the Lear Society and she started, I think, when she first started high school. She attended Central High um, down the street from Girls High and I kind of was like seeing her play the harp and like seeing her, her like repertoire. I was like, wow, that's like so cool. I was like 12 years old watching my older sister play the harp and she's a really talented musician, she's really good at sight reading, she's fantastic at creating music, and I really admire her um, for that. And so when I that's like started attending high school, I was like, my parents were like, you know, you, you can like enroll into this Lear Society program too, like that's a thing you can do. When I started high school, I was really shy, I was really nervous, as you know, everyone is. Um, and so I kind of applied to the Lear Society program, and I got in, and I was like, oh my goodness! <laughs> the harp has kind of articulated my appreciation for like the beautiful pieces and the beautiful, um, the beautiful types of art that people create for people to listen to, and I really appreciate that. And I hope that like people who um, want to learn how to play the harp, want to learn how to play anything, or um, get into that kind of music, like really dig into that because once you hear it in like a beautiful symphony, you won't be able to like not pick it out. You know, whenever you're listening to something and. It's, it's like the best, one of the best things that has ever happened to me. amid these turbulent times. Action News reporter Catherine Scott has more on how one nonprofit went above and beyond to ensure their kids could still immerse themselves in the beauty of music from the safety of their homes. When the schools were shutting down, this nonprofit worked quickly to retrieve harps from schools and institutions so their students could continue to play at home. And as you'll hear, their efforts have been invaluable. So on March 13th, we had a teaching artist text us in the group chat saying, hey, all of our schools are going to be closing and we need to get the harps out. And so we mobilized super quickly and in two days we ended up taking out 15 to 17 harps from schools all across Philadelphia and putting them individually into students' homes. So the process of getting the harps from the schools into students' homes was more of a challenge and less straightforward than one might think. Uh, at Girls High, we have approximately 12 instruments. Uh, the concert grand harps, one to a car, 
the smaller harps that are used for the harp class. If you're very coordinated, you can manage to get three of them in there. Um, then students' homes, you know, we're navigating steps and doors and pets. Uh, and the students live all over town. We had two harps at the Kimmel Center that were being used there for a jazz program. Uh, so it really was a lot of effort from everyone just gathering these harps, getting strings on them, contacting our students who were, you know, trying to deal with the fallout of suddenly, you know, struggling and scrambling to get online learning happening. Uh, but ultimately, we were able to place harps with all of our students who uh, wanted to continue lessons. None of that could have been done without the relationship that I have with the staff and the incredible support system that they are. I've developed relationships with them since I was 13 or so, um, and they've seen me kind of grow up and have mentored me along the way, and having that uh, deep relationship with these people has just made the Lyra experience better for not only me but for of course our students and so I'm incredibly lucky to have such wonderful people as our staff so I think part of Lyra's success in pivoting for COVID has to do with uh, the relationships that we have together. Getting, getting online in a way that facilitated online teaching was a big learning curve for me personally. Uh, I actually did not have internet at home. I had been using my neighbor's Wi-Fi with permission. Uh, I also didn't realize that my laptop that I had at the time did not have a functional camera. So my first few lessons were taught on my phone. Uh, <laughs> and it wasn't the end of the world, but at any rate, I ended up with a new computer, Wi-Fi, several weeks of frustration <laughs> as far as logistics and technology. Um, and then I was ready to really settle in with teaching virtually uh, because at that point it was clear that it was going to be at least the end of, you know, the 2019-2020 school year would be completely virtual. So. Right away from the first uh, online lesson I taught, it was clear that there were obvious challenges. Um, the sound is not so great over Zoom, so it was difficult to really work on sound quality. But there were also a lot of hidden benefits. And my student Tino, uh, in one of our first lessons, accurately noted that because I wasn't able to just fix his arm position, that he actually had to listen to what I said and take it in and then fix it himself. So even that level of just being a little bit more mentally present and focused in lessons was good for the students. Uh, it also forced them to be a little bit more independent. Normally I'm writing all of their assignments and notes in their own lesson notebooks and I still was doing that on my end to keep myself organized, but they were in charge of you know, their own assignment books as well. My name is Sino Karakusis. My name is Maria Karakusis. I'm a ninth grader at J.R. Masterman. And I'm a junior attending J.R. Masterman. And I started playing the harp when I was in sixth grade. I first started learning how to play the harp in fifth grade thanks to the Glissando program. <laughs> since the harp is here at my disposal when I have free time. But additionally, I think playing the harp is a great way to relax after a long day on the screen. And I definitely think I've been practicing more, not only because I have the harp at home, but because I'm more motivated to and just generally I'm attracted to the beauty and calmness of the instrument.
enjoy having two parks at home during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, practicing alongside him is a really fun experience that I'm sure we'll always remember. It has brought us closer, but has also helped us uh, gain a little bit more of a competitive edge and like who can master a certain type of fingering faster. And also we've been able to put on a duet concert and I'm just, we are both very grateful to Lair Society for allowing us to have two parks um, on which to have fun and on which to connect. Obviously, all of my in-person lessons in the schools involved students who were wearing shoes. <laughs> so... I never had to have a conversation about appropriate harp shoes uh, when we were teaching in the schools because they would have reasonable shoes on that they wore to school. So uh, at the point which, at which we started teaching online, Maya had really just started changing pedals in her pieces. She kind of learned it specifically for her all city orchestra preparation. So after a year, of only teaching online, I was able to teach her a mini lesson in person. And at that point she was playing really advanced pieces with lots of pedal changes. And I looked down and she was just wearing socks. And I immediately thought, oh no, I, we've never had the discussion about the fact that you have to have shoes on your feet and you have to have closed toes and probably a heel is gonna be better. And you've learned this all on your own, and I haven't even told you that you have to have shoes on. So there have definitely been a few little funny uh, lapses in teaching, and I'm sure when we go back to being in person, I'll find a few more things that I have failed to address in the virtual format. But uh, looking forward to finding out what those are and probably having a few more good laughs. <laughs> it's like, what? What am I gonna do with her? So I'm glad that you showed up here playing in your socks at least. So that's what I can tell you. Being part of the Glissando family has truly brought a lot of happiness into my life that I'm not sure I would have gotten if I hadn't been accepted to this program. Um, specifically, my little school bubble, my friendship with Maya, fellow student of the program, has blossomed because of our shared experiences in high school orchestra, in um, summer fest experiences in uh, playing in all city orchestra and all of these experiences have really allowed me to meet other young musicians who are just so talented and very inspiring not just at what they do with instruments but what they do in their lives as people and has also opened up uh, a whole network of support of very experienced very knowledgeable mentors that I really look up to and admire. Tell me about your friend Maria and how you met her and how your friendship has grown through playing the harp. Um, okay, so I met Maria. Um, we were performing at the Teacher's Appreciation Day at Masterman, and we actually we were both performing. So we kind of we had kind of talked to each other before, but that's where we really found out that we were actually both going to Summerfest that summer. So we really got in touch and. Um, yeah, at Summerfest, we were the two worst ones there, so we were just, like, really close. <laughs> but, yeah, um, and then, yeah, we've been, like, we've been doing everything together, basically, because we're around the same level, and we're learning, um, we, in orchestra, we're in orchestra together, so right now we're, like, arranging a harp part for Annie, the musical, yeah, together. You guys, you <laughs> <haven't> told us <laughs> that. You didn't tell us that. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jada Wells. Um, I am a freshman at Temple, and my major is music therapy, and my instrument is harp. NARA's college and financial aid program helped me apply for college because they have someone who helps with um, applications, scholarships, and she looks over your college essay, and she reads it for you, so um, she gives you feedback, and you take the feedback and you edit your essay, and you send it back and she tells you if it's good or not, and then you send it off once um, you finalize everything. So that's really helpful. And then as far as financial aid, um, she really helped me a lot with um, filling out FAFSA and everything because actually I had a hard time like during high school trying to figure it out in my senior year. 
so they help a lot. So Lyra not only provides incredible harp instruction, but also gives a lot of college and financial aid guidance as well. And that has just added so much more to Lyra as an organization. Um, a lot of our students do not get the one-on-one -on -one, uh, college and financial aid counseling that they would get um, at a private school. Um, there's usually like one college counselor per like 100, 200 students. And of course, college, the college journey and the financial aid journey is such an individual experience. And so having the one-on-one -on -one time and feeling that support with someone else, with someone who is so knowledgeable, is just incredibly important for our students. We have proudly had 100% of our senior class every year go to a university or conservatory or a college or trade school. And um, every year we've continued to just support our students, mentor them, encourage them um, to pursue higher education so that they may become some of the leaders who will impact our communities in the future. When George Floyd died at the hands of police over the summer, we were not actively teaching our students because it was in the summer, not during the school year, but we knew that they would all be affected. And in the weeks and months that followed, uh, we witnessed this incredible movement of a push for social justice reform and in, within the music community as well, an increased push for diversity and inclusivity. So we immediately started to plan for how we can serve our students better in the future. Students of color have always been well represented in our program due to the fact that we serve schools with a diverse student body. But we also recognized that we could be doing more and immediately got to work planning for the future and how we can continue to serve all of our students and create opportunities for them. And one of the first ways that we really took action was we named our first Lyra leader, uh, our wonderful student, Rebecca, at Central High, who had already started an amazing program to educate her classmates on some of these issues of diversity, inclusivity, and also just privilege. And she was able to do an amazing online presentation for all of our HARP students as part of a virtual meetup. And it really provided not only an opportunity for our students to meet each other, uh, because they don't have opportunities to do that in person this year, but it, it gave several of our students an opportunity to voice who they are, how they're feeling. It gave them a platform to speak up in a very supported, safe environment. As we're seeing now, our kids are having much more complex issues within school, much more complex uh, needs. And so having the ability to, for students to not only communicate that to us so that we can pivot and provide and also for students to have the leadership ability and leadership skills and communication skills to, to tell that to us is not only great for the organization, but of course great for our students. We all felt that it was so successful that we are working on extending the Lyra Leader Program, uh, working on getting grant funding and uh, thinking of ways that we can use this program to elevate our students of color. They all opened up so beautifully and just were so comfortable with each other already, which is really great to see um, as they all, you know, are from across different schools. And I think having the unifying notion that, of course, we, you know, we're all harpists really helped them open up and become comfortable with each other already. So that was really incredible to see and really heartwarming and just, <clears throat> gave me so much uh, hope for the future. One of the things I like to say to a student is that no matter what you do with this harp, no matter where your career might go, uh, maybe you'll become a teacher, maybe you'll become a lawyer, a doctor, 
it doesn't really matter because the harp is a very special instrument. And I feel it's, it's, it's almost like a royal title. When somebody asks you, what do you do? Do you play a musical instrument? Why, yes, I do. I play the harp. I am a harpist. I feel that just saying that emits some kind of confidence in a young person. And when you say, I am a harpist, it opens doors. A life and career hopes and dreams would definitely have to be someone who works with um, children who suffer from autism or any other like um, disabilities, because I think it's something really beautiful to be able to help children. And music is definitely very peaceful. I think it's beautiful to share your passion with other people because people really do gravitate to music and it really, it's really peaceful, it grounds people and it's also very helpful. I would really love to keep the harp and music in general like part of my life. And even if I can't, if I'm not able to keep the harp a part of my life, I know that I will always remember and carry forward the lessons that I've gained um, and the beautiful experiences that I treasure as memories um, through my participation in the Glissando program. I do kind of want to become a psychiatrist. Um, that's kind of been on my mind. And I do think that, um, like, playing the harp, it's not really um, the last resort for me. I think it's probably, like, 60-40 on my radar when I, when I want to go to college. Harp, like, playing the harp is just what I love to do most. So that's probably, I would, my dream is to become a harpist and every yeah that'd be a dream come true
Peace. 